Yeah. Good morning and a warm welcome. Since the room is not full yet, uh, if you want, please also take a seat here at the table with us so that we can have a discussion with you. However, we are going to start now since it's already time. Um, my name is Leah Gimpel. I am with the Digital Public Goods Alliance, where I lead our work on country implementation and artificial intelligence, and I'm your moderator for the session today. And with me, I have Moritz Fromageau. He's with the UN, uh, with the UN Envoy's uh, Office for Technology, <laughs> uh, who's co-hosting uh, the session today, and he's the online moderator. So uh, this session is about the effective governments of open digital ecosystems, and we are going to talk about how to establish a framework for secure and inclusive digital public infrastructure today. And we have a fantastic panel of esteemed speakers here with us in the room, and I will introduce them in alphabetical order to you. First, we have Eileen Danahoe, the Special Envoy and Coordinator for Digital Freedom of the US Department of State. Welcome. Then we have Amandeep Gill, the UN Secretary General's Tech Envoy, who's also the co-host of the session, as I said. Welcome, Amandeep. We have Nele Liosk, the Digital Ambassador at Large from Estonia. Thank you, Nele, for being here with us. Then we have Robert Opp, the Chief Digital Officer of the United Nations Development Programme. Hi, Rob. And Henri Vedier, last but not least, the French Ambassador for Digital Affairs. And before I give the word to my panel, I would like to start by a quick introduction, um, because the term of digital public infrastructure is not always well defined. So I think it's wise to first set the stage and speak about DPI and what we mean by this term for this panel discussion. By DPI, we basically mean society-wide digital capabilities that are essential to participation in society and markets for citizens, entrepreneurs, and consumers, and which are the foundation for public service delivery in the digital area. And this definition basically emphasizes the functionality of digital public infrastructure, right? So it's really about delivering services, both public and private. So what we don't mean by this term really is foundational software, for instance, that underpins any other software solution. So that is one of the common misunderstandings. And we are also not talking about actual physical infrastructure, such as fiber optic cables. So just to be clear on that. And this kind of digital public infrastructure I was talking about, so digital public infrastructure with society-wide functions, um, such as digital ID, for instance, payment systems, data exchange systems, and civil registries, they have seen a real boost during the COVID-19 pandemic because many countries invested in these uh, foundational infrastructures heavily for pandemic response. So for instance, for cashless transfers. And um, yeah, part of this also involved that a lot of attention was given to speedy implementation and maybe not so much attention was paid to actual, secure, safe, and inclusive implementation of these technologies. And I think the important thing to consider here really is that digital public infrastructure with this society-wide function <coughs> really has an extended risk to us, right? If we talk about technologies that is implemented at population scale, we have risks such as data privacy issues, mass surveillance, and for instance, the deliberate or accidental exclusion of vulnerable groups. And that's something that we really need to take care of and also fix in case there was something implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic that didn't really consider any of these due to the speediness of implementation and the need to react. And currently what we see is a lot of momentum around digital public infrastructure. So you might've seen that IGF, it's a, real, it's a topic that pops up in, in many of these sessions. And um, we need to discuss now how to bake safeguards into digital public infrastructure design, implementation, as well as the governance of it. Um, because there's also past dependency, right? So if we implement digital public infrastructure at population scale now, these kind of technologies will have an impact on people's lives over many years. So we need to get it right at this very moment. And there's a window of opportunity to, to do exactly that. And for this reason, um, we would like to talk today about the universal DPI 
Safeguards Initiative that was launched by the UN Tech Envoy's Office as well as UNDP uh, just recently and basically discuss in the session what are the risks and how we can mitigate them, which good practices exist from already existing implementation and the lessons learned around this, as well as about the role of such a global DPI safeguards framework and what it can play, like what role it can play for design, implementation, and governance in the future of digital public infrastructure. And with that, I would like to pass on the word to my uh, distinguished panel uh, over there. And I would like to invite Amandeep to first tell us a bit more about the Safeguards initiative that you recently launched. So why do you think there's a need for something like this, for such an initiative, and what are your plans? Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Jimmy and, and Moritz for uh, moderating this panel. Uh, very pleased to be here uh, with uh, the distinguished uh, co-panelists. Uh, why is there a need? Uh, I think the need arises from the growing interest and the growing uh, consensus on the importance of DPIs. Uh, they have proven themselves uh, to be a powerful way to enhance inclusion in the digital space, uh, to drive innovation, uh, to improve government service delivery uh, reaching the last mile. Uh, COVID was the big moment, but it's been uh, coming for a long time. And you know we have here on this panel, Nele, so Estonia's experience, the experience of India, many other countries. Uh, so it's been coming for a while, and now there is global recognition. Uh, for instance, the G20 understanding on um, uh, a framework for DPIs. Now, as you put it, before we get too far down this road, because there'll be path dependencies, it's important to put together some safeguards to ensure that some of the risks and the problems that we've already seen with uh, digital public goods, digital public infrastructure, uh, for instance, uh, safety online, the security, um, uh, the cybersecurity aspect, data protection aspect, the aspects related to inclusion or exclusion, the optionality, opt-in, opt-out type of issues, uh, the issues related to buy-in from uh, society, issues related to the legislative framework in which uh, DPIs are placed. So uh, it's good to have a global standard, uh, a global uh, guidance that helps the players in the DPI ecosystem move forward confidently. We can't say that you should not have DPIs because that has its own opportunity cost consequences. For instance, we don't say, you know, let's just shut down the digital platforms. They also have billions online, etc. But we have to work actively to ensure that they continue to serve everyone. They continue to serve human flourishing uh, rather than, you know, create uh, um, problems uh, further down the road. That said, I would very concretely um, point to the call by the Secretary General in his policy brief on the Global Digital Compact for a safeguards framework on digital public infrastructure. You know, given the, and I'm sure Rob will speak about it, the demand that the UN has been seeing from the ground, the issues that we've been kind of uh, facing uh, in country, I think it is time to have this kind of uh, framework and the Secretary General has given that call. He's also outlined this problem of fragmentation overall. So if we want to avoid fragmentation in this space, this can be a kind of a unifying um, uh, baseline and it can give civil society and other partners a common reference point. So this is the reason why uh, jointly with the UNDP, we've launched this initiative. But this initiative won't be limited to uh, these two UN entities. Others will join in. It's an open call to all those who are involved in the DPI ecosystem, from DPGA, GovStack, uh, to Dial and other important players. Also a call to civil society and uh, private sector who will be helping build this out uh, and uh, 
uh, manage the interface between the tech side of it, uh, the governance side of it, and the community side of it. Uh, yesterday at an event, someone said that this is a socio-technical infrastructure we're talking about. So it's almost like a socio-legal technical infrastructure we're talking about. So obviously the path forward has to be multi-stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you so much for these initial explanations. Um, you already mentioned UNDP, so I would like to pass on the word to Rob for more about the Safegrids initiative, why UNDP decided to join, and um, what have been your takeaways so far from UNDP's experience in supporting digital public infrastructure implementation? No, exactly. Um, thanks, Leah. And just building on what Amandeep said, um, you know, where we are with this whole kind of discussion around digital public infrastructure is we're essentially in the process of coalescing a movement around that. Um, taking what has been done over the last 10, 15 years in many cases in countries like Estonia, India, and others, as, as Amandeep said, and looking at how can we offer this in a, um, a, a way that will help accelerate digital transformation in countries that are, let's say, not as well developed in terms of the their infrastructure, their digital infrastructure. And what's really key uh, with the whole concept of digital public infrastructure is that it needs to be seen as an approach rather than a technology or a set of technologies. And that approach needs to have the notion of a governance structure around it with the appropriate safeguards. Um, and as you, you mentioned in your intro, um, Leah, as the COVID pandemic basically hit countries and countries needed to respond. And as they, they really mounted their response, it was really clear that the kinds of requests that we received out of countries over time shifted from being very solution focused to much more thinking about what is the overall ecosystem looking like and how do we shape that. And I think it's natural that countries they focus, generally speaking, on trying to solve an immediate problem, and that's where you get a focus on technology first. And I think what's exciting about this Safeguards Initiative um, is that we have now a chance to embed the thinking around what do you need to, when, when you're planning for your ecosystem and you're trying to solve your problem, you cannot forget that it needs to be accompanied, the technology needs to be accompanied by these um, kind of set of safeguards that should be in place to protect people, to protect the future success of your infrastructure work. And so on the Safeguards Initiative, the role of UNDP is to really work with um, the Tech Envoy's office and the convening uh, power that they have and to kind of run the consultations um, on their side, but complement that with what's happening in the field. And as we prototype and create hypothesis principles and safeguards, we want to test them at the country level. So we'll be look, taking three to five countries, looking at the framework as it's developing, testing that and seeing what it would actually look like on the ground. Um, and what do we learn from that? So creating that, that feedback cycle. Um, and then as these, uh, the, the safeguards framework emerges out of the consultations, out of the feedback cycle, really looking at, well, what would it take, what is it going to take to support countries to be able to actually put these in place? And what kind of capacity needs will there be? Really trying to understand what are the knowledge gaps that need to be addressed, and so that this becomes much more, um, let's say, easy to adopt for countries. We, have, we can't just leave it at global principles, we have to really understand how countries are actually gonna be able to do this. So that's what we're really focusing on, that's what we're really looking forward to in all of this. Thanks. So in a nutshell, let me just summarize before we move on uh, to uh, the country speakers. It's about creating a movement around DPI, uh, something that I really like in order to ensure that we protect people and at the same time deliver services. Um, so I really love this notion. And um, as you've all heard, it's an open call for everyone to participate in, so please do so. 
And um, what I also really liked is this idea of talking about an approach rather than technology, because I think a lot of this discussion currently focuses on technological solutions, but not so much about the governance aspects uh, of these. And as you've all heard, countries are central to this uh, initiative. Uh, it's about developing ideas, it's about testing in the field and then going back and uh, uh, working with that feedback. So I would like to move on to our country representatives. And first, uh, I have Eileen uh, here with us. Um, the White House recently uh, announced that the US uh, will work on deploying robust and safeguarded digital public infrastructure. How will this approach be reflected in your engagement for DPI that empowers people by also protecting their freedom? Great. First, let me say thank you for including me. I am a real neophyte on this topic, and I've already learned a lot just from listening to all of you in this room and recently participated in another event with a subset in this room, and I feel like I, I, I'm excited about this. I, I have an instinct that it's really important, and, um, but I'm still catching the thread, so I'll just say that up front. Um, as a human rights advocate, what, what attracts me to this? Um, I feel like it represents a, co a very innovative combination of using technology to basically advance and jumpstart the SDGs in effect and expanding access to digital services around the world. But also, if done right, embedding human rights by design, as everybody has said, uh, or I would emphasize more explicitly human rights by design. Um, and that's a further conversation about what are the terms we use. Um, everybody knows that there is a tremendous yearning around the world to expand access to digital services and that we really do need technology to be um, an accelerant to meeting the SDGs. That's the aspiration and the hope. It would be terrible if we did that in a way that we were actually making the most marginalized, vulnerable communities more vulnerable. So, so that is why, as everybody's emphasizing, the technology and the standards go together simultaneously. And you, you raised it so well at the top, the tension between speed and that yearning, but if you do it in the wrong way, you're only making things worse. Um, and I would also add, I, you know, I've hinted at this already, I do believe the international human rights law framework should be the normative foundation for thinking about this. I will admit the hard part is what does that look like in practice? It's the how. We know what, the how is the hard part. And I will you know, acknowledge that I was in a room recently with Marianne from Access Now, and she raised the point, and she just said it very explicitly, the, ris the big risk is surveillance states and this unconscious drift to, to becoming surveillance states. So that's the really dark vision of this, and that's why we all have responsibility. On the U.S. side, I, basically, that was, uh, I, I, I hadn't seen it. I looked it up last night. I have it. It is... September 22, 2023. So this was after UNGA, <laughs> so after our last conversation. And what really jumped out at me is th this is a vision for the American people. It is domestic. People may be surprised to know the U.S. is really behind on this. Y I think people would be stunned. And it the vision is to transform the way government communicates with the American people and rebuild American infrastructure, um, which e maybe all governments say that's what they want to do, but I think people would be stunned at how far we are behind. And a couple of um, stats jumped out at me. Um, basically, only 2% of the federal government in the United States forms have been digitized. And the public spends more than 10.5 billion hours each year completing government paperwork. And about 140 billion in potential government benefits go unclaimed every year. So that gives you a sense of how far behind we are. So 
in effect, the United States is in this with everybody and has a lot to learn. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point, that it's not only about low and middle income countries, right, but that we are speaking about high income countries and their approach to DPI as well. And I really like this idea of human rights by design, so that's definitely something that I think we need to discuss. And talking about terms, I want to pass on to Henri, um, because France is the uh, country that is always speaking about digital commons. And uh, I would like to know from you, Henri, uh, how is this concept of digital commons and DPI overlaps or how they connect to each other and where safeguards come in? Thank you and thank you for the invitation. I will start with DPI. I, I was thinking that probably France started developing DPIs before we even knew the, there were DPI. Uh, we did develop different levels of digital identity. We've got France Connect. Uh, we are working hard on geographical information, public API, and so on. And this work was probably based on two sources. One was government as a platform. And I can welcome the, the work of the, government, the British government digital service 10 years ago. And the other was a very ancient tradition of public service with all these, its rules of neutrality, accessibility, mutability, uh, uh, equal access, uh, and so on. And the more we did work on these issues, I, I will come to very briefly <laughs> to, to comments. The, the more we did work on these issues, the more we, we've seen them as a more universal challenge. Because we think now that if we want to preserve an open, free, and neutral internet, and if we want also to be true democracies, so without big state or big tech, <laughs> we need this small layer of public services that enables everyone to act in the digital economy and to be part of the decision process. That's why now we consider those challenges are universal and re related to democracy. And that's also why this commitment for DPIs meets our commitments to the digital commons. Um, we can't stress enough, enough just how important the commons are to the internet as, as we know it. Free software, open standards, data, uh, knowledge commons are the very core, of the true core of internet. Um, and these two commitments can easily be linked, so they don't overlap. It is possible to conceive good IPRs that are not uh, commons, and some commons uh, do not become infrastructures. But when the two ambitions come together, it can be very powerful. And if we, just to finish, if we come back to the question of safety, uh, uh, I think that we cannot conceive a real democracy without public infrastructure. But not every infrastructure will empower democracy. That's simple. So we need to conceive, and that's why we, we welcome the, this work, we need to conceive a set of rules. Probably we know most of them, but we, we have to order them, like real transparency, uh, uh, transparent governance, shared governance, security by design, privacy by design, uh, etc. Uh, but we need to, to make a proper work <laughs> and to share this broadly, um, because Again, I, I finish with this, we cannot, uh, we, we, and not, not just me, France, we consider that we cannot conceive a fair development of internet without good public infrastructure, but that not every infrastructure will empower democracy. Thank you so much for these comments, and um, I, yeah, I really, uh, I think it's a fair point to say that we, like, and then, in a way, we know the rules, we know the principles, right? We talk about these buzzwords, transparency, accountability, and such. But I think there's a real good point in it that we need to move forward from principles to practice. And, um, at this and do you have experience in implementing DPI? And as you said, I mean, you've been implementing DPI without calling it DPI for quite a while. And I think the same is true for Estonia. We talked about this uh, earlier before the session, that what you're doing, you don't call it DPI, but it is DPI, what you're doing. So Nella, from your experience uh, as uh, Estonia as a global digital leader, um, what considerations should be integrated in such a safeguards framework uh, and how should such a process look like when we develop it over the next couple of months? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leah, and, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I believe I will actually su summarize or build on what all my good colleagues uh, have already touched upon. Uh, but the first is really the, the notion of the, the DPI. Uh, that is, I would say, a, a rather new term, but, but actually standing for some of these important principles in, in digitalization. So from this point of view, I believe we all have uh, good experiences. Uh, it's not the usual suspect of uh, Estonia and, and, and India and, and many others, but um, all countries have, I have digitalized uh, their societies to some, ex uh, to some extent. But uh, to give answer to, to your question, I believe uh, it, it might be useful actually to revisit some of these origins of, uh, of what we, we call uh, DPI, that is a, a new movement or a, or a trend as we have, uh, uh, have heard. And some of it actually Henry uh, referred to, and, and this is really the, I would say, one of these origins is uh, philosophical and, and the other is perhaps more practical. So the philosophical really comes to understanding the role of the government in, in, in our society. Is it only to serve uh, the people by providing services? Is it also to act as a, as a partner? Um, uh, is it to share everything that the, the government does? So, so we can say that actually um, digitalizing, following these important principles that, that you also mentioned, openness, transparency, inclusiveness, it started really with uh, rebuilding Estonian state in the, in the 90s. It started with the freedom of uh, uh, information, it started with privacy issues, it started with security issues, and then it moved to the digital sphere where we started to talk about interoperability, uh, open standards, and, and so forth. So it, I would say that it was really, um, I'd say this logical continuation uh, of what we had uh, uh, started to reform uh, in reforming our, our state. But the other uh, reason um, is actually very practical. And this uh, really uh, Estonian government sort of started to realize in the 90s that, uh, that actually the needs of the government, uh, but also private sector and other partners in digitalization are, are rather similar. Um, and, uh, and this came to joining forces and really sharing our, our resources. So in the 90s, Estonian government, together with the private sector, started to develop on, uh, for example, a digital identity that was uh, uh, mentioned. And uh, we, we do use one digital identity across the government, but also private sector. Um, and uh, this is actually one of these um, important, or this led actually to one very important precondition for the DPI to work. And this is really the habit of working together and building trust. Because on the one hand, yes, we can build trust by uh, setting principles, uh, having a great legal framework, but it is definitely uh, not enough. All the partners need to feel that they equally contribute and they equally also take responsibility and at times also risks. And, and the last thing we often forget that uh, in order to, to make things work, at, at sometimes we must be ready to, to fail and take, uh, uh, take responsibility uh, for this. So uh, these would be perhaps uh, uh, some of the takeaways from, uh, from Estonian uh, side. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think failing for governments and taking responsibility, that's definitely a challenge uh, for many still. So um, that's probably something we can also learn from Estonia, uh, if there's anything <laughs> that you want to share. Um, I really like this notion of, you know, building cooperation and trust and involving everyone in this effort, right? So as uh, Amman Lieb explained in his initial statement, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative, so this uh, idea of a DPI safeguards framework. And it's really about involving everyone to take part in developing these principles, but also, you know, defining how to move into practice with that. And um, I would now like to, well, ask you as my panelists to react to what you've heard. So Nella already summarized bits of it, but we have a bit of time for a rather open discussion before I will open it also to the audience and uh, ask you to uh, raise your questions both online as well as here on site. Um, so another 10 minutes for the open discussion among the panelists and then I will open up because I already saw a hand over there. <laughs> so it's definitely a topic where many uh, questions uh, exist and we need to discuss. But uh, please first, uh, if any of you want to react to what you've heard, uh, please go ahead. And if there's uh, nothing, I have a range of questions, of course, as well prepared. <laughs> 
Maybe I, I could uh, quote um, an Indian friend from Bangalore that told me recently, Europe, you did build your prosperity and your independence uh, through public infrastructure, rails, uh, roads, uh, train, uh, water. And, and then suddenly you did stop <laughs> at the end of the 70s <laughs> for some ideological reasons. And the economy did continue to evolve. And now um, digital identity, uh, infrastructure for payment uh, are as important as roads a century ago. And it did convince me. <laughs> So I do have a question. Um, we talked about the tension between speed and standards. Amandeep, you, you said it right at the top that we, you know, you're talking about the need for global standards and that works for me because I think of the human rights framework as a global standard, as a basis and an anchor for thinking about these things. Already universally applicable and it's an understood language. However, when I think about it in the context even of my own government and the approach that I just described, it strikes me that the way many governments think about providing public services pre-digital is that it's their job, it's government providing services. And so um, I think all governments are well, most government, many governments, hopefully, are learning about multi-stakeholder process and understanding when it comes to digital technology, they need help, and that means including the technical community, civil society, academic experts, et cetera, private sector. Um, I think there's been progress there. If you add then the global multi-stakeholder approach to governments, that's, that's a bigger leap. So part of me, I raise this because um, I think that's where the human rights framework can help because governments will be comfortable that they've already signed up for this and they know what it is and they, there, there's a sense of trust. Otherwise, I think governments will be reticent to, and, it's, and even in terms of political discourse domestically, the idea of including a global multi-stakeholder input process might seem challenging to people who haven't been exposed to global multi-stakeholder process. So that's one of the areas I see that we really need to help governments sort of jump ahead and collapse this tension between local, domestic, and international. Yes, if I may jump in quickly, I think building on Eileen's point, I think the foundations are essentially twofold. There is human rights, the international human rights commitments, and there's the SDGs framework, uh, leaving no one behind the 17 goals, gender equality, even good governance, uh, zero hunger, uh, removing poverty. Uh, so those are our foundations, and the opportunity from local to global is that we have next year the Summit of the Future, so the Global Digital Compact is going to be one of the deliverables for that summit. So how can we, when we are translating the vision of the Global Digital Compact on accelerating progress on the SDGs, addressing the digital divide, alongside how can this safeguards framework, this enabler, as Rao put it, for the DPI's movement overall, uh, you know, how can that be a concrete offering to support that vision and to uh, take it forward? So in a sense, we are going from that agreement among 2021 20, now in the G20, uh, which is path-breaking in New Delhi to a larger framework where you have uh, 193 countries, uh, civil society, private sector coming together um, to, to endorse this movement. And my last point is on this, the private sector aspect because it is not just government services, public services we are talking about. What DPIs do is they create an innovation ecosystem. They, uh, through this combination of common rails, guardrails, they lower the entry barriers to innovation, linking with Ahi's point about the digital economy, the importance of a dynamic national digital economy where you have, yes, citizen-facing 
government services, but you have businesses, uh, whether they are coming from fintech, etc., who are boosting the demand for digital services and digital products. So there is a supply side paradigm on infrastructure that we are used to, but DPIs are more complex and more sophisticated because they play on demand as well. A farmer who really doesn't uh, have I an mean, incentive to connect, you know, can the DPIs and the services provided on DPIs, both publicly and privately, can they create that demand for that farmer to say, okay, I need to you know, plug in as well in an empowered way? Uh, maybe just to uh, stress uh, some uh, aspects which, which I believe um, are important when we talk about this DPI uh, movement or discourse. And what I really like about uh, the DPI is, is it, uh, it actually reminds of, um, of the basics. So when we look, for example, the conversations here over the past uh, uh, days and, and generally this year, and I'm sure also next year, it is all about... Uh, very advanced things, uh, AI, Internet of Things, uh, there was a blockchain uh, buzz uh, a few uh, years uh, back. And uh, at the same time, many of the governments and societies actually that are talking about AI and, and, um, uh, and everything else have not yet actually fixed the very basics. Uh, data governance, digital authentication, and, and so many other things. So I think all the basic public infrastructure. So in this sense, I think uh, DPI has uh, spotted it, it well that we, we, we need to have this base in order to uh, move uh, 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 further. Uh, and the second is actually related to the myths that also Amadeep and Henry and others uh, uh, pointed, and it, it's really about the role of, of the uh, uh, private sector. So DPI does not, or a good digitalization does not mean that the government is, uh, is doing everything, but it's really about sharing what it does, uh, and uh, and really making sure that some of these important principles like security and privacy are guaranteed, because uh, this is uh, an obligation that is different from from the private sector. So it is a public sector's task to to make sure that the the people feel good in this virtual world. And and the third one, and this is maybe a call actually also from my side, is really related to sharing and reusing. Uh, there are so many governments that are making their tools available, that are making the, the source codes available. We see a lot of sharing. We don't see that much reusing or even doing together. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, comes to the, the question, like, why, why we don't do that? And it's probably uh, trust issues, maybe readiness issues. There are, there are different issues, but definitely a mindset uh, issue. So... From Estonia, we have a good example together with our great uh, neighbors in Finland and Iceland, where we have come together, we have created a foundation. Uh, we make sure that we uh, develop certain digital products together because we need them. And we also make them available to, uh, to the world and also make sure that they update it to security and other, other requirements. So I think this is a good example of a, of a DPI safe, uh, safeguard. But, uh, Definitely, I'm, I'm calling uh, us to, to share and, and use more what others do. Yeah, and actually, Nelia, you, I, I was going to pick up on something you said earlier, but also this comment. Uh, my reaction, when I listen to these conversations and, and in all of our engagement this year as part of the G20, as a knowledge partner, and in all of the other discussions that we have, I'm constantly thinking about how do we take it from, I think as Amandeep you said, the, the, the 20 or so to the 150, 170, 100, uh, the, the countries that are out there that haven't done this or done it in a sort of package the way that we're talking about um, as an approach. And what strikes me is um, we can get our technology packages and we can get our standards packages, but there is still a mindset issue. and that will take some time to get people, let's say, somehow we have to learn how to incentivize people to share, to work together, change the mindset, um, and really understand that this is a, a movement that we're pushing toward. And I think the safeguards initiative we're talking about today is a step in the right direction to do that. The implementation and how we scale is what is kind of on my mind constantly. So 
that my call to the genius that exists in humanity out there is what are the scalable ways to ensure that we're changing the mindset as we do this? Can I make a three brief comments? First to Eileen and Amandip, yes, you're right, we have two sources that are the SDGs and human rights, but maybe there is a third one, and you know it very well, Eileen, this is the Open Gov movement. What we did learn 10 years ago is that everything a government does can create much more value if we unleash innovation. We saw this with data, with uh, source code, and now we can see this with uh, infrastructure. And that's, uh, we have a lot of important lessons to learn from this movement. The second point regarding private sector, just to mention, when I did uh, mention uh, the long tradition of public service, <laughs> a public service can be made by private, se private sector. Uh, public service don't have to be free. The thing is that the public service cannot uh, has to respect some rules and cannot be the man in the middle take, taking all the added value. He has to be neutral, to be equal access, to, to be, uh, you, you can finance it, but uh, you cannot take the added value. So we can easily build it with the private sector. And the third and last point, uh, Nele, you're right. A lot of people try to share and few people try to cooperate. And that's one other way where we can inspi be inspired by the common movements. Because to build community, to work all together, I is not the same thing as just to share the code. And you have to think about cooperation, governance, but even if you go into the details, good documentation, uh, g g uh, certain kind of codes, and uh, this is not so easy. You cannot just open your code like this. Thank you so much, all of you. And I think there's a lot of appetite uh, for discussion also amongst the panelists, and I think we could go on and on here. Um, I would like to open it to uh, the audience now uh, with their questions. If you want uh, to ask something, please uh, line up at the microphone. And for those of you who are sitting more in this area, we might also pass around uh, the mic uh, if there are questions. Um, please go ahead, and Moritz, be prepared to uh, also, raise some online questions, please. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, we collect some, maybe we collect some questions and then we allocate them among the speakers. Yes, go ahead, yeah. please. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished speakers. Leo, for bringing them here, everyone. I'm Ale Costa Barbosa. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm a fellow at the Weizenbaum Institute in Berlin and also a coordinator at the for the homeless workers' movement technology sector in Brazil. So I'm representing those who really rely on DPIs, let's say. And just a quick moment on self-marketing. We co I coordinated, had the opportunity to coordinate a, a research we launched in 2019 on the identification for developments on how in Latin America, I think it's really worth it. So it's, it's indeed a, a really old discussion, for, thing, for instance. And recently, we were about to launch a report on, on digital education and in terms of infrastructure and sovereignty uh, held by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, which I think it's should be considered not only as more sectoral applications, uh, and I also like it to hear the fact of geographic information systems being considered DPI somehow for you and here. Uh, but I like to hear like in the GDC, the Global Digital Compact claims for sustainable DPIs. And taking into account that uh, the last meeting of G20 in, in, in India somehow came up with a common agenda and the following two hosting countries will be Brazil and South Africa, I like to hear how can we really ensure that DPI will be sustainable considering the environment, the last mile, if you're not taking physical infrastructures into, into account. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Mahesh Perra from Sri Lanka. It's good to hear that, I mean, we have been uh, talking about digital government, connected government to DPI. Now, in this journey, I mean, I think, I mean, Estonia has quite successful in digital government, connected government from since, I mean, from the inception. I mean, many countries have failed in the design, in the implementation, as uh, the moderator said about in the governance. I mean, all three stages, we did mistakes and uh, not achieved the expected result. Now, I'm quite pleased to hear that we are talking about DPI standards and DPI safeguard initiatives. It's quite good. I mean, uh, I would like to see if you can talk about DPI by design, DPI by implementation, DPI by governance. 
I mean, it's all about standards. It's about giving st standards, giving about uh, certain measures that government and the implementers, implementers must follow uh, by the design, by the implementation, uh, by the governance. Thank you. Is it off? It was off. But I think that my voice was loud enough and everyone was kind of listening, right? Like over there, Marina was listening over there. Oh, I have a good theater voice. Okay, um, I was saying thank you so much for um, bringing up uh, the, the potential for surveillance. If we don't get it right, right? So we have to think about, um, as it was mentioned, human rights by design from, from the stage from design before implementation. This is a main concern because of the tension that we were mentioning earlier about the speed and the lack, like, like, uh, the speed for implementation, like we are re really running towards it, and uh, we cannot uh, implement the safeguard at the same time we are implementing the infrastructure. It has to come before, otherwise it won't work. And this comes then to the main concern that we have, which is the concept of human rights by design needs to be unpacked. We need to mention specifically what do we mean by that. And even though we do have, of course, human rights framework for the world, we have like all of the declarations, it needs to be said specifically what it means when we talk about privacy, when we talk about freedom of speech, when we talk about rights that we usually do not touch on when we talk about uh, technology, like the right to dignity, the right to autonomy, and all of this is involved because we are touching on very essential aspects of the human experience, basically. So when we build safeguards for these processes, um, safeguards, just saying that we ha need to have safeguards, is not enough. The safeguards need to have a way of being implemented that al allows for the systems, um, if we realize that they are ha causing harm, the systems to be stopped or even rolled back. And we do not have that in many, many places. I, I work on, on digital ID and, and the systems there. We have the, the safeguards are about negotiating maybe the possibility of an ev eventual remedy, which is not enough at all. Uh, and we do need remedy, but we also need to be thinking about stop and roll back if needed to be able to reconsider, reevaluate, and implement changes. And we, we had a lot of conversation yesterday around um, the fact that uh, there is no a mod there is a model of digital ID that just works and it is constant uh, uh, learning it's a process of, process of constant learning in the context so we need to be open um, for the infrastructure to be adaptive to be responsive to what it might or might not be working and the question here because I swear there is a question I swear is um, are we giving any thought uh, to the right of anonymity in here? Because I think that we all agree, because this is a standard, an international standard, that uh, the right to anonymity is essential to freedom of speech and generally civil and political rights, and also rights like autonomy, again. Um, but if we create com uh, models that are all encompassing in a way that they require to be identified at every step in places where we don't necessarily need to uh, have that amount of information of the person, then where is the space for the people to be private, to hide, to have that space that is needed as human beings? So my question is, we are implementing this infrastructure, yes, for the farmers, right? Because we need uh, um, them to, to get the services that they need, but how much information do we need for the farmer? Thank you so much for all of these questions. I may just stop here um, and uh, quickly summarize. And uh, Moritz, uh, if there's anything that you can add to this package, uh, please uh, do say so. Uh, just quickly, we uh, had a question around sustainability of digital public infrastructure. We had a question around uh, DPG standards and what it uh, means uh, to implement DPI uh, in a way of human rights by design and what is behind there and what 
about the right of anonymity uh, of people. Is there anything that you can add to this little package of questions? Yeah, there was one uh, question online on the enforceability of uh, the safeguards framework, because yeah, what good is a nice standards standard if we can't yeah, enforce them on the ground? Uh, please go ahead, whoever feels inclined to answer. Thank you. So very briefly, you say that sometimes countries uh, have failed. And I totally agree. Uh, I don't know if you know, but before being a diplomat, I was a state CTO for France. So I had to conduct some of this transformation. And the dirty little secret is that governments are not always able to make simple, <laughs> to make it simple. And to respect open standards, to build small pieces, uh, re reusable, to, to build a to respect uh, agile methodologies uh, is not uh, very usual for governments. I don't know if you can imagine the state IT for France, for example. I had to disconnect some projects that did cost 1 billion euros, for example, and that did fail after 15 years of uh, expenditure. So we have to... Th the dirty little secret is that there is also a digital disruption within the history of IT. And we have to change the way we, we do develop. Uh, that's not simple, but we can do it. And we, so, so that's one important thing. And when we, the more simple we d do develop, the more small pieces uh, of clear standards we, we use, the more it's easy to make an inclusive and um, sustainable uh, infrastructure. You, you did mention uh, homeless workers in Bangalore. The Tuk-Tuk, you know, the rickshaw, they did alone using uh, UPI and Bacon. They decided to avoid Uber. So they did pay, but that was really inexpensive, maybe 50,000 euros, 50,000 dollars. They did develop the solution to call a rickshaw, and they did implement some Indian rules. So, for example, you can bargain, you can negotiate the price. And that's very interesting because they told me we were there decades before Uber and we'll be there decades after Uber. So why should we organize ourselves through Uber? So they decided to have a direct access to a very important infrastructure. Just w in one word, I think very often about the how can an authoritarian regime use uh, infrastructure. I think that we can implement some securities, and we will. But in fact, an infrastructure is an infrastructure, and if you have uh, evil purposes, you will use the infrastructure to for your evil purposes. I, uh, that's the same with trains, with a highway, with uh, everything. So we cannot protect democracy just through while implementing rules in the infrastructure. We need more. I don't think there is anything to add to what Ami has just said. You know. Uh, maybe our uh, Brazilian friend's question about uh, the incoming G20 presidency. Uh, so that's an opportunity to kind of, as Rob put it, uh, uh, make this movement more sustainable uh, and more, uh, in a sense, uh, contextual, uh, contextually uh, interesting <coughs> in, in, in Africa, in, in uh, Latin America. So building on what has been achieved during the Indian presidency and uh, uh, Ahi and many others have played a key role in that uh, amazing outcome. So it, that needs to be taken to new areas. Those learnings incorporated, as Nelly has said, you know, we need to bring in those learnings. And then in the Nordic region, you have this kind of an ecosystem that uh, of mutual learning. So can we build it in other places, make the DPIs work more um, regional and context uh, sensitive? And uh, on the point about enforceability that came online, I think uh, what we can do by leveraging the GDC process is to ensure that when there is a regular review and follow up of the GDC uh, principles action framework, that there is a regular discussion as part of that on how we are doing on DPI. So where this safeguards framework acts as a reference point and there is a regular discussion. And there, you know, obviously we can create some soft pressure, um, some normative pressure 
on those who are falling behind or not you know, living up to that standard. So I will just underscore several points made by a colleague from Sri Lanka, Henri Amandeep. Um, I'm hearing two, three added uh, reasons that a global open standards are valuable. One is well-intentioned governments who may have failed or would otherwise fail need the help. And so sharing the, n the knowledge and the know-how is valuable. Second, to Mariame's point, a glo and Amandeep, global open standards actually increase the likelihood of accountability or that the standards deployed will be higher than would otherwise happen if governments are left to their own devices. And that applies to well-intentioned governments who do things the wrong way with inadequate standards and less well-intentioned. Amandeep, your last point, though, underscores why or how the Global Digital Compact process itself with follow-up can add not full teeth. I mean, even the international human rights law framework is not fully enforceable, in fact, but the soft norms, the, that kind of pressure and global open eyeballs on everybody's systems adds value. So there's, there's a real benefit. I'm afraid we are running out of time here. Sorry for that. Um, Eileen, you already did a great job in summarizing what we've been uh, discussing here. Thank you. Um, I would like to add uh, a few quick points as well before I uh, give it over to my panelists again for a quick 30-second uh, key takeaway uh, message from each of you. Um, so what stuck with me uh, specifically is that the DPI Safeguards Initiative is an opportunity also to reflect on like in a philosophical way on the role of government, right? So what is it actually that governments need to do in a 21st digital area, and how can we make sure that they deliver on that, both in terms of public service delivery, as well as in being a partner for citizens, as well as for the private sector. And this connects quite uh, nicely to this pragmatic approach as well, which I would coin as a society, like DPI, uh, as a society-wide approach, right? That enables everyone to build on top of it, including the private sector, including building an innovation ecosystem, which I think is a very, very important point in order to also help dig the digital economies to evolve. Secondly, we also talked about vehicles and how to bring on and create commitment for the Safeguards Initiative. And the Global Digital Compact uh, was mentioned as one of these vehicles, but we also discussed uh, the Human Rights Convention, as well as uh, all the work that has been already done on the open government uh, uh, partnership and initiatives around this area. So I think there's a lot of legacy work, actually, uh, that we can build on. And <coughs> certainly as a DBGA, of course, I really like this idea of sharing technology, of sharing learnings, and of reusing these and building cooperation around these. And what stuck with me specifically is this idea of changing mindsets while implementing at scale. Thanks, uh, Rob, uh, for this great, uh, great sentence here. And I think that's exactly what we need to strive for when we are implementing. So these are my key takeaways. Over to you, uh, esteemed panel. What are yours? Yes, uh, I will actually uh, end by responding uh, to some of the questions, which I think were actually very important also to keep in mind when we talk about the public infrastructure. And one is related to sustainability. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, terms may come and go, and maybe in five years' time we don't talk about DPI anymore or, uh, or connected governance or mobile governance. It's actually important uh, not to lose what has uh, been done uh, before, because we often see that projects come and, and, uh, and go, and sometimes governments give up, civil society gives up, but we need to uh, remember actually that changes take time, and actually people are rather conservative. So we see that actually from Estonia, that uh, in order for certain service to be uptaken, some new change to be, uh, to be implemented, we may need uh, six, seven, uh, eight years. Uh, the internet voting uh, that we still um, uh, carry out uh, in Estonia, first time we had 0 0.8 uh, 
uh, percent of uh, votes coming uh, via the internet. Now it's almost 50 percent of the uh, of the voters. And the second one is really about uh, how we can uh, guarantee uh, privacy, security, and and now we have also you know human rights a bit uh, by design. It's actually not a one country issue. It, it is a global issue, and it's not a government issue, but uh, also private sector and increasingly private sector issue. So. Um, uh, there comes the, the role of actually of these global movements that we have been talking about. Please a short answer. Yeah, okay. Well, I have many takeaways, but I'll only, I'll mention one, I guess. Um, maybe, two, well, no, I'll mention one. <laughs> um, n I, you know, I think what, what strikes me in, in this conversation and kind of connecting dots with a lot of other things is, um, although these things take time and people are inherently conservative, um, we have waves that are coming globally, like artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies that will challenge the human ability to keep up. Um, and at the end of the day, governments are a human endeavor, um, civil society is human endeavor. And the question then becomes, how, how might we really construct this approach globally with the safeguards and with the scalable uh, packages of human rights by design, uh, privacy by design, the, the other things that we know are important. How might we do this and roll it out as quickly as possible while creating trust and while creating that sharing? And this is just kind of what keeps me awake at night, kind of what drives us to, to work on this, which is why the potential is so strong for this approach. I'll leave it there. One word. Someone did ask uh, how will you implement or enforce this approach? And I will say, we will do it because it's, it's the most efficient way, and we'll prove it. To empower the people, to unleash innovation, to guarantee fundamental freedom is the most efficient organization for the economic and social development of a country. I'd just say that this is the beginning of a journey uh, that uh, we just announced the initiative last month, and uh, this is, in fact, the first official co consultation. So, uh, uh, Going back to your point, Mariana, about uh, some of these uh, um, granular issues around uh, right to anonymity, uh, unpacking the concept. So we are at the beginning, and with your help, we'll be able to uh, do that. Thank you. Exactly that point. Unpacking the concept of human rights by design. What does that look like in practice to do it well? Obviously, cross-regional cross-stakeholder group, but I would underscore cross-disciplinary in the intellectual sense, because it really is about people who understand norms, soft norms, and hard law, how it works, and technologists and the innovators. And bringing them together with a shared language is also part of the challenge. So it's the beginning of a journey. Thank you so much, everyone, my speakers, the audience. If you want to know more about the DPI Safeguards Initiative, they have a website uh, where you can read up on it and also uh, subscribe to their newsletter if you want to know more about the ongoing con consultations. And with that, I would like to end it and wish you all a great day. Thank you. <laughs>